Welcome back to MMG. So, you guys know me. I don't want to uh, spread fear or anything or blow things out of proportion. I'm really against that. But, but, I, I think this um, possible epidemic, it, it is, it's going to be, I believe, uh, is definitely going to affect the markets. And the global economy in 2020 and um, I was doing some research looking at some things I'm gonna give you guys my case not financial advice consult your professional licensed financial advisor before doing anything and uh, stocks extremely volatile extremely risky do not invest in anything you're not willing to lose or lose sleep over anyways uh, I'll talk about the markets and the news and what's going on but um let's talk about this virus because i think it's a little more serious than everyone thinks i'm gonna tell you guys why and no it's not gonna be the end of the world uh it's not gonna be like you know the black or the bubonic plague right the black death uh although I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So it's like day two, right? Since I found out about it, it's day two. Uh, this really came on the scene, I would say, two days ago. Today is, um, by the time you're watching this, it's Friday. Technically, it's Friday. It's 1 a.m. here. Um, so Wednesday, the, the, the news sort of broke on this, right? And within like 48 hours, we're looking at uh, 25 deaths, 830 patients infected. That's pretty quick, right? So we're going to talk about that. Now, before I go into that, let me give you guys a little brief history lesson here. So influenza flu, right? It infected 500 million people around the world, including people on remote Pacific islands and in, Ar and in the Arctic. Probably 50 million and possibly as high as 100 million, 3 to 5% of Earth's population at the time died. So 3 to 5% of the Earth's population died back then, right? And of course, they didn't have the medical advances we have today. But also, they didn't have such an interconnected world where there's thousands of planes flying every any given minute all around the world, just transferring people all around the world from one from China to the u s every day it's happening, right? And uh, of course, it's already hit the u s. So it, it's one of the deadliest uh, flus or pandemics that's ever hit humanity right it killed more people than world war one and two combined which is a lot and 500 million back then is i i don't know what the equivalent would be today but 500 million i mean what there's seven eight maybe eight billion people on the planet at this point right so a thousand million is one billion that would be well, they said 3 to 5%. Some of this math doesn't add up. Um, it's definitely 5 to 10% if it's 500 million. Oh, they were infected. About 50 to 100 million died. So, okay, that makes more sense, right? Either way, 100 million uh, back then. I don't know what the population was. Maybe it was 2 billion or something like that. It'd be right around 5% of the world's population. Now, in perspective, right, 5% of the world died today. 
um, that would definitely crash the markets, especially China, if a lot of them was Chinese, right? Because the, uh, they're the second largest economy in the world. I showed you guys the pie chart yesterday. So the influenza killed uh, the young and the elderly. Matter of fact, it killed uh, the young with strong immune systems. Just some facts there. So that was the last very big pandemic, right? The most recent one was SARS. But let me read this. This is kind of why I think they're, they're downplaying this a little bit. And I'm going to show you guys why. At present, the, fat the fatality rate is lower than that of SARS. And this is, you know, the World Health Organization. At present, the fatality rate is lower than that of SARS. But the more people infected, the more people die. In addition, a, pa a patient called Super Spreader, which spreads the infection to many people, said Tohoku University Hitashi Hashitani, appears and there is no guarantee that a major epidemic will occur and should not be taken care of. All right. So here are some facts about this, uh, this new, um, it's a coronavirus. A coronavirus is just like the type of virus. It's like, it's like the, f it, it is like a flu, right? The coronavirus are a large family of viruses that cause a range of illnesses. As explained by the world WHO, coronaviruses are large family of viruses that cause illnesses ranging from the common cold to more severe diseases such as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, and Severe Acute, severe acute Respiratory Syndrome. Right. So the coronaviruses are zoonotic, meaning they are transmitted from animals to humans. So that right there, that reminds me of um, the bubonic plague, right? It's spread through uh, rats and mice. Let me show you guys something. <laughs> Reminds me. Look at this. He's eating baby mice. <laughs> Loving it. <laughs> at least he buttered it up, right? It's a delicacy in China, apparently. All right. I just wanted to show you guys that. I know some of you don't want to see it, but that is juicy. All right. I bet it's crunchy, too. Anyways, let's get back to it. Uh, so, yeah, this might be a super spreader. All right, so coronaviruses are airborne. Air by coughing and sneezing. The CDC advises they can also be spread by close personal contact, such as touching or shaking hands, touching an object or surface with the virus on it, then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes before washing your hands and rarely and and rarely fecal contamination. All right, so this is what I'm trying to get at. This this is airborne. It's spread by coughing and sneezing. I know some of you are like, oh, so what? So was SARS? Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, January 17th, 2020, at least three U.S. airports reportedly will be screening travelers arriving from Wuhan, China, New York's John F. Kennedy Airport, San Francisco International Airport, and Los Angeles International Airport. So the major international airports in the U.S. are going to be screening, all of them. Or they already probably already are. And uh, it's been in the news. Um, they're looking, they're scanning people's body temperature and everything. So there's, and then there, I saw this thing that they were like putting on people's foreheads and they'd walk to the next person and do it, which is incredibly stupid. That's the way you can spread it. Anyways, <laughs> um, current risk to the general pub public is low, but officials are being proactive and prepared. Nevertheless, Dr. Miss, Miss something said, we believe the current risk from the virus to the general public is low. All right. Like I'm saying, they're okay. So some people are saying, "Oh, they're hyping it up. It's just they're scaring people. It's distraction. This and that." Yeah, hold on. Let's just 
Just wait, just wait a second. It, it actually might be serious. And I was thinking that in the beginning too. So the death toll hits 25 fairly quickly. A couple days, not even a week, right? WHO estimates coronavirus is about as contagious as the Spanish flu, which is the influenza, right? More than twice as infectious as the common flu. So more than twice infectious than the common flu. And a lot of people get the flu uh, in the winter, especially for some reason. Probably because we're all indoors and, you know, it has nothing to, nothing to do with the weather, but your immune system, uh, you're more exposed to indoors and in, in being indoors with other people, right? Um, like when I was in college, right, every winter I would get something. Anyways, uh, Wuhan, people are collapsing on the streets due to the deadly... Right, so here... Here's a video of them carting people out in these boxes with windows. On. <laughs> like they're they're being completely quarantined. All right, people are just straight up. They're not dropping dead, but passing out in public. They're just standing there and just look at this keeling over. When was the last time, um, so do you think people who got SARS or any type of, or even the Spanish flu, just fell over standing there? Just standing. You're, you're, you're fine, you know, you feel a cold maybe, but, you know, you, you don't feel like you're just going to fall right over and pass out. So, here's the thing. Remember Chernobyl? And the the commie Russians, well, the thing is with these very centralized bureaucratic uh, commie countries, is they really want to save face, right? Meaning, they take pride in uh, it, it's a show. It's like a con game, right? It's a confidence game. So. You have to, your country has to seem very strong, effective, economically powerful, this and that, when it's centrally planned, and especially to the rest of the world, right? It's like a, it's like a, a communist thing. Because once people see weakness with the system, the centralized planned system, then they grab their uh, pitchforks and torches, right? So here's what's interesting. With Chernobyl, right? They didn't admit to it ever. Only when in, um, I think in uh, Finland, when they picked up radiation levels, like some nuke went off, um, that was the only time the Russians had to admit that Chernobyl melted down. But they knew prior to that. You should watch the, the show on HBO, right? Really good show. I, I recommend it. I watched it, and uh, it was a good one. Um, and it was pretty, um, like it wasn't, um, they didn't over-exaggerate anything. It was, everything that happened in the show happened in real life. Uh, I watched a lot of clips, like old clips. It was really fascinating. Anyways, um, so what I'm trying to say is, it's probably very likely the Chinese government is playing this off. Like, it's not that big of a deal, right? And... They just quarantined three major cities, about to do two more, like all their major cities, meaning the people can't aren't allowed to leave the major cities. Over 24 million people right now, or 23 million, are right now not allowed to leave their cities, there's curfews, and they're driving around, look at this, they're driving around spreading uh, some sort of anti-bacterial virus uh, mist all over. The, they're crop dusting their cities. I love, like the DEET stuff. I'm pretty sure this is bad for you as well, the chemicals. Um, but they're, they're doing this all over, all over the cities. Now, do you think... 
do you think that this might be a little more serious than anyone's saying, right? Now, I know the Doomsday Clock was moved a little bit closer. Who cares? It's so stupid. Doomsday Clock. They moved it all the way to, like, almost a Doomsday because of climate change. So, it's all bullshit. But that this is fear, whatever. But, um... Most of the mainstream, right, media, I mean, they're saying this is like another outbreak of SARS, okay? Here's the deal. SARS didn't spread like this, not this fast, okay? And they weren't taking uh, measures like this back then. Now, I understand this might be precautionary measures because of the last outbreak, which was SARS, but again, this is something new. It might be uh, mutating still and becoming stronger. And the fact that people are just literally keeling over like while they're standing in public is... Um, I don't think that was happening with SARS. I could be wrong. But that, that seems very uh, disturbing and alarming. They're crop dusting their cities. And now over 23 million people are stuck. And they've pretty much shut down all their airports in China. Now that alone is going to affect their economy and the global economy because China is the second largest, about 20% of the global economy, right? All right. So where was I? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many videos, so many of people just falling over. It's spread all of, it's it's spreading very 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 quickly. Like look at this. It's just people walking in public. When was the last time a you know a serious flu literally knocked you off your feet and you passed out while you're walking? Cuz usually you know, it takes like half a day, a full day for it to slowly set in and for you to feel sick, your head hurts, you start your nose starts running and all that, right? These people are just walking and then they just pass out. So what that tells me is that this thing's strong. So WHO estimates virus contagious is a Spanish flu more than twice, right? The real Umbrella Corp, Wuhan Ultra Biohazard Lab, was studying the world's most dangerous pathogens. Right. So, this is a conspiracy. There's n no, like, confirmed information on this. But apparently, they, um, in that city, they had, like, I think their first uh, major, like, Resident Evil type <laughs> lab where they started making um, and preventing... Spart started experimenting, let's just say, with, uh, you know, very dangerous pathogens that could spread. You know, if they get out, you're going to have epidemics, pandemics, right? So, that's just interesting. It's fun to maybe follow. You never know, right? You never know. Here's a nice map, interactive map. It's kind of creepy. Here's another one. So I like this. So confirmed cases. The red dots. This key right here. I'll post this in the newsroom so you guys could look at this yourselves. Play around with it. It's a nice interactive map. But uh, the larger circles, obviously, there's 54 to 550 confirmed infected. The orange circles are 54 to 550, right? Suspected cases. Now look at this. These are every single major city in China, in mainland China. Here's uh, Shanghai over here. They have about confirmed like 500, whatever. Look how, but the point is how fast it's spread in just a few days. In just a few days, right? And look how fast this thing is spreading. It's alarming how fast it's moving. I don't, I don't think SARS 
travel this fast. And I'm going to show you guys some information on that, how fast it did spread. All right, the new Wuhan coronavirus has apparently already spread to the U.S. with the first case reported in Washington State, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sales in affected areas during the SARS epidemic in 2003 principal, principally because the mortality rate for the new virus appears to be much lower than SARS. Right, so th this is what the mainstream, like every article is saying this, that the mortality rate is not as large as SARS. And SARS came and went, right? It wasn't that big of a deal, right? The problem is, it didn't spread this fast. So if this spreads, let, let's say, theoretically, does spread to half the world's population, well, 3% of the half of the world's population will be like a thousand times, or who knows, much, much greater than 15% of what SARS affected, right? China, with the, cl the closures and airlines impacted by a drop in travel, added SARS was estimated to have cost $33 billion by the World Bank. That may seem like a lot, but the seasonal flu costs an annual $11 billion in the U.S. alone each year. And this is the Herald.com, right? So... U.S. stocks fell Thursday, but they recovered. Listen, th they're playing this down, okay? They are, and here's why. I'm just going to get to it eventually here. So the, the SARS outbreak in 2003, 8,098 people, so whatever, 8,100 people were infected. 774 died. Keep that in mind. 8,000 infected, 774 died. Uh, from that map I just showed you, it looks like there's more than 10,000 people infected in China right now. How long did it take for SARS to infect 8,000 people? It actually took like a while, like a couple years, I think, because there's a timeline. The timeline's the next article. Okay, so the main way that SARS seems to spread is by close person-to-person -person contact. It's not through sneezing and airborne. It's through contact. Now, yes, you can get SARS from sneezing, but you have to be, like, in the person's face a distance of three feet because it travels through respiratory droplets. So it's it's droplet. It's that's how it's spread. It's through droplets of like mucus, right? That you can see with your eye. When it's airborne, it's it's more than that. It's like the virus itself is just flying through the air. It doesn't have to be in droplets. Uh, maybe a sneeze could actually when you sneeze, I, I there's a fact on it. Something like you shoot out whatever viruses or cough flu whatever you can shoot it out up to like 20 25 feet something like like it'll fill a room okay that's why you cover your hand but even then it doesn't really stop it that much it just stops it from going further but when you sneeze you can spread something about 20 to 25 feet don't call me look it up something like that right but you know the SARS seemed to only spread about three feet so it has to literally be like mucus or some sort of uh, droplet coming from your mouth like saliva <clears throat> so um, that's what I'm trying to tell you what if this new stuff this new coronavirus doesn't spread it spreads much easier meaning when someone sneezes, this thing goes like 20 25 feet now, I'm not trying to scare you it's not gonna be the end of the humanity because everyone's gonna put on masks <laughs> And um, M3 stock might be good to look at because they make those masks. They make good ones. Um, so eventually it'll be contained. But it's the economic ramifications of this. All right. So on 16 November 2002, an outbreak of the severe, severe acute respir respiratory syndrome SARS began in China's Guangdong province, which borders Hong Kong, a former in the Shandai district, whatever, 
likely the first case of infection. The People's Republic of China notified the World Health Organization about this outbreak on February 10th, 2003, reporting 305 cases, including 105 healthcare workers. So about 410 people, right, on February 10th. Early in the epidemic, the Republic of China discouraged the press from reporting on SARS and lagged in reporting the situation to the WHO, delaying the initial report. Initially, it did not provide information for Chinese provinces. Right, exactly. And that's probably what they're doing right now. And, you know, they could argue that they don't want to start a panic. All right. Hong Kong's first patient checked into the Metropole Hotel February 21st. So this is what I'm trying to tell you guys. By February 10th, there was like 400 people infected. In Hong Kong, first person, person checked in on February 21st. That is what? About a week and a half went by and then someone got infected in Hong Kong. This thing in three days has gone global. It hasn't hit Europe yet, but it's already in South America, U.S., Japan, and uh, Philippines. And it's probably in Australia. So what I'm trying... And then look at this timeline. So it started in 16 November 2002. By 10th of February... 2003 right so three months later two months later two months later you have 400 people infected two months not two days right now this thing just went two days and we have more infected than there were infected with SARS do you see what I'm saying this thing is spreading much faster because in two days we have more infected than they did in two months. You guys can fact check me, put it in the comment section. I just did a quick research. All right, this is on Wikipedia. <clears throat> so, and then it took a couple years. So it started in 2002, and by 2005, it was said that there were no more cases. 774 deaths worldwide and what 8100 were infected okay it's day three day three we already know there's 25 uh, fatalities and there's probably more infected from looking at that map i mean looking at this map i guarantee you because, okay, so it's admitted about 800 have been infected. I guarantee you it's 10 times more. So uh, probably 10,000 have been infected at least. That's what I'm assuming, right? I'm assuming, I'm guessing. Because a lot of people haven't been reported, right? So this in three days has has done more than SARS did in three years. And even if the fatality is 3%, not 15 just because the sheer amount of people that are going to get infected so quickly and it's spreading so fast, it's going to do more damage. Now, here's the thing. Psychologically, this is this is doing crazy damage to the economy. China is the second largest world economy, right? They just canceled Chinese New Year, like their biggest holiday. No more traveling. They're quarantining all. All the cities, people, so people aren't going out and shopping for things they don't need, right? Um, they're not going out. There's already, like, problems in the cities where there isn't food and people can't get water. So everything's shutting down. So that means the economy is shutting down, okay? People aren't going out, doing getting services. People aren't even going to work now. And the, the entire country shutting down, which is what? 20%? I just want to make sure. I did post this, ironically, not too long ago. Like a couple days ago, right? That map. Here it is. 
No, that's a uh, trillion of world debt. This is world debt. China's 10% of world debt. United States is 31%. <laughs> and Japan's 12 It's interesting, right? Um, where, where is that chart? Here it is. Yeah, so China is 17.7% .7 of the world economy. Uh, and the U.S. is about 30. I guarantee you these numbers aren't correct, but close enough, right? It doesn't matter. China's second largest economy in the world, and the entire country is about to get shut down and quarantined. It looks like. It looks like. All right? If that happens, you better believe this global slowdown is going to kick in the high gear. All right? And that's all I really have to say. Um, you know, will they stop the you know the spread of this? Yeah, eventually. Now, the third world, when it makes its way to the third world, because at the trajectory of this thing spreading, it's going to be in the third world by like, it probably already is, <laughs> um, yesterday, right? So, oh yeah, man, this, this thing could devastate like Africa. Uh, and, you know, they don't have, you know, they're gonna they're not gonna they're gonna be less prepared for this because they they just start financially and everything and are they gonna all have uh breathing masks are they all gonna get the news quickly enough so this could devastate uh third world and the second world right uh more so than the first because the first world could act quickly and it still has resources and money and everyone could go and and buy a mask actually i suggest you order one right now i just thought of that i have some because i you know uh, i i just have them because painting or whatever but um if you don't have one you might want to get one you never know um i already i'm sort of paranoid so i already have some food prepped and I've, you know i'm like a little prepper here so i'm i'm good i just I'm a little low on water, so I'm going to go get that. Should maybe get some gas. <laughs> I don't know. You never know, guys. It, it it doesn't hurt to be prepared, right? Uh, Here's virus masks, search trends on Google. It's uh, This was back during uh, 2009. Huh. And then 2014, something break up, broke out. I think it was Ebola. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the economy and stuff like that real quick. 180 billion asset man manager. There is no way out. Fed policies can no longer be exited without provoking the next crisis. Look at this chart. This is how disconnected the market is from reality. This is why the market's not even dipping. It's still going up higher with like a pandemic happening in the world's second largest economy. That's how disconnected it is from reality. So when this thing drops, it's not going to be an elevator. You know, it takes the stairs up, elevator down. Nah, this is going to be like the do the elevator door opens and you take a step, except there's no elevator. You're just falling down the chute, <laughs> the elevator chute, right? Or shaft, not chute. Right, so the problem is, as soon as the Fed stops repo or anything, it's just... The dominoes are going to start falling. The debate is over. In two months, not QE officially becomes QE4. So while Neil Kashikari may be theoretically appealing to the intellect of the QE conspiracists, which is of today in addition to Robert Kaplan, Larry Kudlow, and James Gorman also includes as part of the chart. By the way, this is uh, Tyler Durden, you know, Zero Hedge. You guys can see who it is. Um, Gorman also includes as part of the chart below Bank of America, in addition to any other person within an even modest understanding of monetary policy. There's a chart in between this paragraph. Uh, chart 7. So what is this? The S&P correlated well to the 12MA. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, to explain to him how the Fed is moving prices with its $60 billion in monthly purchases of T-bills, something we did last week, and 
A key development is coming that will make all such debates mute. In a few months, the Fed's not QE will officially become QE4. The reason following an update to BMO's bill supply forecast, the bank's rates strategist John Hill sees a great likelihood that the Fed will need to reduce its demand burden on the bill market. There won't be enough bills available for the Fed to monetize without it distorting the market and will extend the purchase program to include short coupons. In the process of officially ending any debate whether uh, the Fed's manipulation of the market under the guise of saving repo is not QE because it is limited to bills and thus no duration is taken out of the market or is QE4 in which the Fed purchases at least some coupon securities in addition to bills. Once the Fed makes the shift, BMO expects a monthly size of $60 billion or $30 billion post-assumed taper would be composed of both bills and short coupons, helping to reduce expected pressure in the bill market. At this point, he'll put 75% odds on this change occurring by mid-March. So he's saying by mid-March, they're going to have to start buying short-term coupons, which is just straight injecting cash <laughs> into the banking system, meaning that any by March... So, two months from now, meaning that any uh, debate whether the Fed's injection of anywhere between sixty billion and hundred billion liquidity each month into the equity market is or isn't QE will very soon be mercifully over. Right. I mean, listen, they were literally uh, doing a test run. They were saying last week that we should. Uh, we should give this repo option for hedge funds, hedge funds, private hedge funds who invest money for private clients and something blew up. There was long-term capital management, some hedge funds, probably a bank and a few hedge funds. Who knows? I And the Fed doesn't care, even if they keep pumping the market higher, because if they don't, uh, we're going to get a Lehman crisis like 2008. What if BMO is wrong and the Fed does not adjust purchases to include short uh, short coupes? In that case, the the Canadian banks foresees a $321 billion reduction in bill supply. Here's the problem with all this uh, QE and all of this uh, repo stuff. All right, guys, everyone's like, listen, man. they could." By the way, all the bears are capitulating. Everyone is capitulating. Everyone is like... Listen, it's just gonna go higher. I'm not. I'm not capitulating. I'm sticking to my all-time high call. Yes, now it's like off by 130 points. I don't give a shit. This thing's gonna dump soon. All right, that's what I believe. I could be completely wrong. Talk to your licensed financial advisor with that ISO uh, dress shirt and tie. All right, but um, listen. Mix with this pandemic and. The fact that the markets are so overstretched and my TA is telling me we are very like we should have a correction like tomorrow. Right. Um, I don't care if the Fed's pumping money into the market because the Fed can't bail out the world. Who's going to pay for that? Is, is every American going to become indebted like ten million dollars or something? Because in the end, it's the Americans who have to pay this all. But you have to understand, all this QE money, it's not just bailing out U.S. banks and hedge funds. It's bailing out globally, everyone. Because it's become a global Ponzi, right? So <laughs> that's how insane this is. That's why there would be pitchforks and torches if Americans still had enough uh, brain mass and IQ to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> that you are bailing out in your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and probably past that is bailing out the world right now. <laughs> and, and the U.S. economy has no manufacturing industrial base. Like, that, see, that, that's what's going to end humanity. This, finance, this global Ponzi is going to end humanity. Not, not a flu, all right? But this flu could lead to it, right? Because it's going to weaken the global economy. Then we're finally going to get the bubble popping and the correction. And then, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Because this experiment, the, it's an experiment of central banks. Um, it, it's never been done before. It's uh, globally. And I don't know, guys. I don't know.
Let's look at some charts. Oh, there's another article. Basically, um, I'll talk about it more in my next video. Uh, so CFOs, chief financial officers, and CEOs, right? The two head honchos of major 500 fortune companies and most companies on Wall Street. Like, they're more than half or about half right now. There was a new survey that just came out. It was a Reuters, Reuters article. Um, they're actually bearish on the economy for 2020. They see a a slowdown coming, and this is uh you know with conditions this good, hitting all time highs in the markets, and uh, what that means is they're gonna cut back on hiring, and they're gonna cut back on purchases and inventory. Uh, if they believe that, then that's what they're gonna do, right? So. And we've just recently hit all-time unemployment, right? According to their numbers, which is, you know, smoke and mirrors. But so historically, when we hit the bottom with unemployment, what happens right after that? It spikes up and we get to go into a recession because it's the business cycle that the central banks created with um, the credit cycle, right? With messing around with interest rates and at this point, just printing money, injecting it. Uh, so yeah, um, it's, it's guys, it's going to happen. The beginning is going to happen in 2020. Am I saying there's going to be a stock market crash? Like, no, there could be a big crash, like 15, 30%, but I'm not saying it's going to go like just crash, like and go to zero or anything. Although all the shorts have pretty much just been squeezed on every major stock out there. So all the shorts just got wrecked. So what I'm thinking is, if my TA is right, this might be the time to start shorting. And I know I freak out when someone goes, oh, that means short the market. Because only retards say that um, in the comments section below the video. I never say that. Because shorting is extremely risky extremely risky and it's like nobody gets exciting about excited about shorting like i'm never excited to short uh it's just something i do when i'm very very confident right and um i'm getting very confident that uh this party is coming to an end very soon or at least all-time highs are are in and then um we're gonna get some sort of correction big correction uh and this is why let me show you real quick as nasdaq s p 500 fang index dow jones russell 2000 vanguard international markets three-day charts it looks ready guys i mean it just looks ready if I if I just look at the S and P, if I just look at the S and P, it's so the the gap from the two hundred day moving average and where the price is right now is insane. We're gonna look at that in a second, but let's look at Apple here, Alphabet, J P Morgan, Amazon, Microsoft, Berkshire Hathaway. They're just straight going up still, <laughs> still. And these are monthly charts. Look at this. Let me zoom in. It's insane. And no, these are not logarithmic charts. All right. Let's just do a simple, um, wish I could find it. Uh, here we go. Nope. Here, we could um, change this up real quick. I don't want to dox all the stocks I'm looking at, so I don't want to bring down my uh, thing. This is Tesla. Oh no, this is the S and P five hundred. 
So let me zoom in. This is a daily chart. <laughs> Look at this. So historically, the price always uh, reverts back to the mean and hits my blue equilibrium line and then bounces back off of it and goes higher, right? Except for the last, uh, well, this uh, was the 20% correction, right? Earlier in 2019. But it should at least revisit my blue line because historically it tends to do that, right? Revert to the mean like it did back here. It's back tested, right? It does it quite frequently. So this is a bit overextended in my opinion. Look at this. By the way, it did start selling off in my nine cell. So I did call it so far on the S&P 500. Right now it's at 3,325. So the top might be in right now, literally. And I think it might be. By the way, tomorrow or today is Friday. Just take back Friday. So, you know, like, uh, what, 12 or 14 hours from now, the market's going to close. And uh, smart money might want to take profits this Friday and not hold over the weekend while China is uh, having a, a uh, you know, like World War Z uh, and like end of times, 28 days later type event, right? I think that would be a smart move not to hold long on some of these stocks. But look at this. The 200-day moving average is right here. It has to at least revisit the 200-day moving average at some point. And it's extremely, extremely far from it. So a drop back to the 200-day moving average would take us down 10%. But it's 10% technically overextended. And then, of course, it could overshoot it, right? Who knows? We'll see. But I do think a huge correction is coming. I'll do more TA in my next video because I talked about, you know, a lot of the virus. So smash them likes. Leave anything in the comment section. Visit my website. Oh, yeah. Um, check out uh, Mike Maloney's... Um, check out this video. It's pretty freaking good right here the ultimate guide to gold and silver mining stocks mike maloney buying miners listen guys this is what i knew but i didn't have this chart that they have if you want life-changing money it's going to be through the miners it's not going to be through anything else i believe in this world it's going to be through these mining stocks so watch this video so you understand how undervalued they still are because you don't understand. None of you get it. Because if you did, I'd have way more people uh, going to my website and then uh, purchasing and getting into the private group. Because more than likely, it's going to pay for itself. That's what I'm hoping. I'm not promising that, but I'm pretty sure it'll, it will. It should. Unless you buy, like, you know, who knows. I, I can't make any promises, right? I'm just doing research information. I am... Um, sharing my own trades and the stocks that i'm looking at the private group is just a bunch of people trying to help each other out great group of people by the way we even have news i share my I, you know i let you guys know what indicators i use that you guys see on my videos and then um what else i have like a basics to trading tutorial um but yeah go to my website watch that video that's what to expect and then decide for yourself um I want to get, I'm very close to getting a hundred private group members and I want to get there. And I also want to, um, just accumulate some more mining stocks. And I, I want more money. Like by the time when this thing corrects, then yeah, I'm going to have plenty, but you know, gold looks like it's consolidating. It's going to break out. I'm going to make another TA video because the weekly is coming up on the ninth cell. But again, if this market sells off, uh, gold's going to take off, and so will silver. All right, guys, uh, till next time.